Once again, we just want to give a big congratulations to our class of 2023. We are so, so very proud of each and every one of you. And so next up, we're going to be jumping into uh, our message for today. And so what we're going to be doing uh, for today's message is we're actually putting a, 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 we're actually taking a pause from our series that we're currently in through the book of Acts called Unstoppable. And we're going to be talking about a message that is certainly going to apply to our senior class, but it's definitely going to apply to every single one of us in the room. So no matter if you're here with C-Kids this morning, the, the warehouse, our student ministry, or, or any age you are, even if just a full-blown adult, today's message is going to be... Um, perfect for each and every one of us because it applies directly to what we all need in our lives. So do me a favor and welcome up to the stage the one, the only, Pastor J.D. Well, as Pastor Joel said, I hope you've been enjoying the service so far. And I just want to say to my upper and lower deck friends, welcome. Hey, buddy. Um, yeah, we, we love having you here. For those of you at the warehouse, you guys are here for a very intentional reason. We didn't just wanna cancel children's wing services. No, we wanted you to be in this room and there's a reason. And that's because we want you to think with the end in mind. We want you to think, hey, someday I'm gonna be a senior up on this stage and what do I want my words of wisdom to be whenever I uh, am ready to give, give my, my thoughts to the, next, the people that are coming up next to me? What do I want my relationship with Jesus to look like? You know, how do I wanna serve and give my life away? If you're new here, I know we have a lot of new faces because we have all of our seniors and probably some family and relatives decided to join us. We have seven objectives as a church. They're kind of the markers that determine whether we're effective as a church. And one of those is impacting the next generation. How well are we impacting the next generation? Well, I think that one of the ways that maybe we could uh, be most effective at that is actually allowing the next generation of seniors to speak to those who are just slightly younger than them in age, to be able to share some thoughts and some truths that they've learned because there's just something powerful about hearing from someone who's just a few years older than you. It just tends to stick. So today I wanna transition though from talking to the upper and lower deck students and the warehouse students to really talking to all of us. It doesn't matter if you're here in the room, out in the loft, you know, up in the loft, up in the balcony, out in the out in the uh, the lobby area, watching online, wherever wherever you are, and no matter what age you are, you could be nine or nineteen or forty nine or ninety nine. I want to talk about a particular question that is universal. It applies to every single one of us, and the question I want us to ask today, and this is in your notes if you're taking notes today, is this: How do I live out God's will? in my life? Huge question, huge. It's especially huge if you're graduating from high school because obviously this is a big moment, a big end of a chapter, beginning of a new chapter. But the thing about this question is, is it doesn't have an expiration date, does it? It's, it's a question that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, whatever stage of life you're in, it applies to us. And if you've ever found yourself living in God's will, what, what do I mean by living in God's will? I mean, knowing what God wants you to do and living it out obediently, you know something, that there is just nothing on planet earth like living at the center of God's will. It's an adventure. There's so much freedom. There's, there's just nothing like it. Now, God, he gives us all sorts of different ways in understanding what he wants for us in our lives by directing us. I mean, there's so many different dimensions we could talk about. You know, we could, we could talk about what it, what it, the importance of, of cultivating a deep relationship with Jesus so that you hear his voice above the crowd always. Or, or we could talk about what it means to, to, to be led by the Holy Spirit in such a way that you are so flexible and adaptable that when the Holy Spirit prompts your heart, you can't help but take action. You forget about your agenda, you forget about your will, and we just jump into what God would have us do. That is a great way for us to understand God's will. Another thing would be to understand that every decision we make has a consequence, that every decision we make, it leads us somewhere, either toward God's will or away from God's will. Now, these are just a few of the many, many ways that we, could, we can turn to help us discover what God's will is for our lives, but... Today, I wanna, I wanna focus on a particular method that may not be the, the first method that comes to your mind when you think about discovering God's will. We're gonna take a look at Ephesians chapter three, verse 20 to kind of start us off. Here, here's what it says. Now, all glory to God who is able 
through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish how much? Infinitely more than we can think or ask. Infinitely more than we can think or ask. You know, when we truly believe the words of this verse, that God can do infinitely or immeasurably more than we can even fathom, it is then that we step out, of fa- out in faith and we seize the opportunities that he has that aligns with our will. It is at this level of faith that we have courage to take big spiritual risks, to step outside of our comfort zones and say, you know what, I'm not really comfortable with this, but I'm gonna do it. It's whenever we, we seize opportunities for the promptings of God that we didn't recognize before, but because we are seeking after God's will and we know that he can do infinitely more in and through our lives than we could ever imagine, that we decide to do so. Well, the method that I wanna talk to you about today is actually the, the title of my sermon, and it connects back to this Ephesians chapter three verse. If we wanna live out God's will for our lives, well, then we have to be on the lookout for divine interventions. Everybody say divine interventions. Divine interventions. Now, when I say a divine intervention, what do I mean? What's the, what's the definition that we're, we're gonna use? So let me give you a simple but, but important definition for a divine intervention. A divine intervention is when God shows up in your situation in one way or another and guides or encourages you. It's when, it's when God shows up in your particular situation in one way or another and he guides you or he encourages you. These are the moments when God chooses to have direct involvement in your life and he, he shows you his love or he shows you his wisdom or he gives you direction or in most cases, all three of those things through his divine intervention. Now, it's important to note that divine interventions, they aren't just simply coincidences or, you know, a stroke of good luck. No, these these are, these are times, these are divine appointments when God orchestrates that he is a God who is not some God way out in the cosmos who wants nothing to do with our lives and he's just distant from us, but that no, he is a relational God and that he cares about the details of your life that he cares about the little things that are going on. And not only does he care, but he has the power and the desire to intervene in your life in a miraculous way. And so we have to keep our eyes and our ears open to these divine interventions because they will lead us to his will. Because the bottom line of my message is this, and that is that God reveals his will through divine interventions. One of the primary ways that God reveals his will is through these things, these situations where he steps into our lives in one way or another to encourage us or to guide us. But I truly believe that um, God's will is the biggest adventure you could ever experience. That if you can truly live in the center of God's will, there's just nothing like it. And it's, it's exciting and it's fun, but if you've ever been on an adventure, if you've ever seen a movie that's an adventure movie, you know that sometimes there's ups in adventures and there's downs in adventures. Sometimes there's good times in adventures and sometimes there's some difficult times in adventures. Sometimes there's peaceful moments in adventures and sometimes there's conflicts. Speaking of conflicts, How many of you have at least one sibling? Anybody here have at least one sibling? Yeah, uh, looks like the majority of us in this room. Um, Of those of you who just rose your hand, how many of you would say that you've experienced some level of sibling rivalry in your relationship (laughs) in the past? Yeah, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And um, in most cases, it's harmless. I don't know if this one's harmless. Um, that may not, that may end up serious, but in most cases, it is a harmless thing. But I wanna share with you a story from the Bible about two biblical twins where it was very serious. In fact, it got to the point where there was literally, literally an actual death threat attached to the sibling rivalry. Now, if you're a student at the warehouse, I shared a portion of this story from the book of Genesis just a while back. But this, this story comes from the book of Genesis and it's starting in, ch- in chapter 25 all the way to ver- chapter 33. And we're introduced to these two brothers. Their names are Jacob and Esau. 
They're twins, Jacob and Esau. And to be honest with you, their story is, it's disheartening. It's discouraging. It's a little confusing. And their sibling rivalry is so deep that it started literally before they were even born. The Bible tells us that Jacob was the younger brother and he was born just seconds after his older brother, but he didn't wanna be. And so he was trying to get out of the womb first. So when he came out, he was actually holding on to his brother's heel, trying to beat him out of the womb, but he didn't succeed. And from that point on, Jacob is considered the, the baby of the family, despite only being seconds behind his big brother, Esau. Now, in today's culture, being the baby of the family probably has some perks. Like how many of you are the baby of the family? You get away with murder. Anybody in here? Yeah, I, yeah, I see those hands. Yeah, absolutely. You know it's true. But back then, that was not the case. It was not a benefit to be the baby of the family. It was, it was the benefit to be the firstborn male of the family. And so despite this split second age difference, it came with a whole lot of benefits for Esau and it came for a whole bunch of drawbacks for, for Jacob. For example, Esau, because he was the firstborn, he was considered the authority figure in the family. And so basically, if he made some sort of decree, he would sit everybody down. If he said something, everybody had to just kind of go with it and they had to accept what he had to say. Whereas, you know, Jacob was more known as just the mama's boy. He liked to hang out at home and he just, you know, he didn't, he didn't ever went away to camp. You know, he was kind of like the kid that just stuck back with home because he was a mama's boy. You know, Esau, he was blessed with the perks of what is known as the birthright. Huge perks, huge benefits. Jacob was more on the trajectory of living in his parents' basement for the rest of his life. I mean, that was pretty much where he was headed. But what you need to know as part of the birthright is that Esau was gonna be given a huge amount of the inheritance. His father was extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy. And so he was gonna be benefited and blessed with this huge amount of money while Jacob, he was gonna be left with the scraps. Now, as the twins grew up and as they, they got older, Jacob continued to build up this resentment toward his brother. He did not like that he was the second born. He vowed, just like he tried way back in the room, in the, the womb, that somehow, some way, he was gonna get ahead of his brother. But how? Well, it sounds ridiculous, but if you know the story, the way Jacob successfully does this is with some trickery, major trickery, and a costume. So here's what happened. Years have gone by. They're no longer kids. At this point, they are now grown men, and their father, Isaac, is now um, on the verge of dying, and he knows he's about to die. And so he calls his older son, Esau, into um, his tent. And he said, Esau, I'm about, I, I don't know how much longer I have to live. And so what I want you to do is I want you to go out and hunt for me. He was a fantastic hunter. And I want you to go out and I want you to hunt for me. And I want you to, to bring it back. And I want you to prepare a meal for me. And then at this point, I'm ready to go ahead and hand over my birthright blessing to you. Well, Jacob, through the grapevine, hears about this plan. And so in the middle of his brother going out into the wilderness in order to hunt, Jacob sneaks in as if he were his brother in a costume, tried to like disguise his voice. It's dark. We're told that his, that his father is, is almost completely blind at this point. And he says, hey, this is your son, Esau. I'm ready for my blessing. He brings him a meal and everything. His father falls for it. And he gives him this verbal blessing of the birthright. Now, it might be like, well, why didn't he just take it back? Because you couldn't. It was a verbal contract. It was, it was irrevocable. He was not able to take it back. And so not knowing any better, Isaac, the father, hands Jacob the birthright, which includes this massive inheritance. And now Jacob walks out with the birthright. And guess what Esau has? Nothing. So as you can imagine, Esau, he comes back and he is furious. He, he can't even imagine what has just happened, that his brother would deceive his father like that, that he would steal what was rightfully his. And so he vows at that moment that he is gonna take payback on his brother. And we're not talking about a wedgie here, okay? We're, we're talking like, I'm going to kill you at the next available moment. As soon as our father dies, I am going to kill you. 
that is what is going to go down. And so for the next, who knows how long, Jacob is constantly looking over his shoulder because he never knows when his brother's gonna come after him. Eventually it gets so stressful that Jacob decides to flee his land and go out into the wilderness. Now he's a mama's boy. Chances are pretty good he's not gonna make it out there, but he has a better chance out there than he does with his family because he knows his big brother Esau is coming after him. But, and this is important, before Jacob leaves his family's household, he goes back to his father. And this is, this is something I believe that, that we can learn uh, about God's will for our lives and understanding what God wants for our lives. This is a takeaway that we can actually learn from Jacob. And, and he goes back to his father's tent before he leaves. And he asks for some advice. And despite being extremely mad and extremely disappointed, I'm sure Isaac, the father, gives his son both some advice and some directions. And so this is the first of three ways that we're gonna talk about that scripture helps us to see that God uses divine interventions to help, us, to help God reveal his will to us. So here's what it says in Genesis 28, verses one through three. It says, then Isaac, the father, commanded Jacob, the younger son who stole the birthright, do not marry a Canaanite woman. At, go at once to your mother's father's land. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of many people. So what we see in this passage is two things. We see Isaac, the dad, give some, uh, some advice, and we also see him give some directions. So what is the advice that he gives his son? He says this. He says, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Instead, take a wife for yourself among the daughters of Laban. Now, why does he say that? Well, because the people from his mother's homeland, they shared the same belief system about God as his family did. Whereas the Canaanite women, they had a different view. They didn't serve the same God. And so maybe you've learned this the hard way in your relationships, or if not, I hope to, to tell you about it today. It is incredibly important that we line ourselves up with the right spouse. It is incredibly important that we choose somebody who we are equally yoked with. Because if not, all of a sudden we're like, oh, but I'm sure I can change them or you know, whatever and that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden we start to get sucked into them and away from God. And his father knew that. And he knew that if he could connect him to a girl from his mother's land, well, then at least there's a better chance of them being, them being in line, in alignment with, with the, the kind of belief system that they could both agree on when it comes to their relationship with God. So that was the advice that was given. But then his dad also gives him some very specific directions. He's kind of like GPSing him right here. And he says this, he says, go at once to your mother's father's land. He tells him specifically where to go. Here's the takeaway I want us to get when it comes to God's first way of revealing his will to our lives. You see, God often uses divine interventions by sending godly people to speak to our lives. That's the first form of divine interventions is through a godly person. I think we, we have to resist the urge of, of overthinking how God speaks in our lives. I think sometimes we, we complicate it, you know? We, we overcomplicate and we're like, oh, God is so mysterious and I don't know if he's speaking to me. And a lot of times, you know what? He's speaking through the wisdom of somebody who, who can see from a perspective that we cannot see. And, the, and their words and their wisdom and their opinions can carry us in the direction, a divine direction, because they can see things that we can't see. And they're not emotionally attached to this decision we wanna make, and, and, and we are, and so we have to trust that their perspective is better than our own. See, I think a takeaway is never underestimate the power of counsel of a godly person at the right time in the right moment. Never underestimate. The, the power of a godly person and their counsel in the right time at the right moment. And yes, students, this is, this is gonna be hard to hear. But in some cases, that might even come from your parents. <laughs> I know, I know, it's hard. But all I can say is, in this particular story, where did the godly advice come from? From Jacob's father. 
It came from his father. God leveraged the life advice of Isaac, his dad, to give Jacob the right direction. My point is this, if you desire to go to the right place, if you want to go toward God's will, if you don't wanna go toward God's will, then surround yourself with whoever you want. But if you want to go in the direction that God wants you to go, you have to surround yourself with the right people and listen to what they have to say because they just might know better than we do. So what does that look like for us? I mean, how do we do do that in today's world? Well, I mean, for any of us in this room, it could be asking somebody who we really look up to because of their parenting skills or because of how they manage their money or their their relationship with God or just, just their general demeanor. We could say, hey, would it be cool if like once a month I, I bought you coffee at Starbucks or if you're not a coffee drinker, you know, we went down to, to the smoothie place, you know, what's it called? Um, tropical smoothie, you know, went down to tropical smoothie and I just bought you a drink like once a month. And would you mind if I just ask you some questions and just kind of absorb what it is that you're saying? Another thing is, you know, in our C kids, uh, upper and lower deck, as well as at the warehouse, being in a small group is a requirement of students. Um, we, we do it because it's our discipleship philosophy is to teach them in a large group and then they divide up and get a chance to talk about it in a small group. But guess what? That's not a requirement of the adults. We can't force you to be a part of a small group. But what if you said, you know what? I need to start surrounding myself with the right godly people. And so I am going to require myself to get into a small group. People who can lift me up and encourage me when I need to lift up and who can give me a kick in the rear when I need a little bit of accountability. For everyone in this room, whenever you're here, at the where, here or at the warehouse or in, in children's ministry, grab a pen and your notes and there should be smoke coming off of your pen whenever somebody's up here speaking. The reason is, is because you're here anyway. You might as well absorb and retain as much information as you possibly can. And one of the ways you can do that is by writing it down because it shows that when we write things down, we are so much more likely to remember what it is that we heard. Another thing would be that we embrace the right relationships in our lives. So what I mean by that is, we need to find people who are adders in our lives or better yet, who are, who are multipliers in our lives. Like they make us, they, they multiply us. They make us so much better that they multiply us. And we need to stay away from, and you all have people like this in your life who are subtractors. People that whenever you're around them, it feels like they suck the life right out of you. Worse yet, we need to stay away from the dividers in our lives. The ones who cause disunity. If if we can do those things, we can begin to understand God's will. You see, when it comes to your relationships, you are the sum total of your inner circle. You're the sum total of your inner circle. If you show a wise person your top five friends, they could probably tell you where you're gonna end up in life because you're so heavily influenced by the people that are around you. Okay, so let's go on to the story of of Jacob's retreat into the wilderness so he can get away from his brother who's trying to kill him. But before Jacob books it out into the wilderness, his, his dad has another thing he wants to say to his son. His father goes on to say, may God give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham. That would be, that would be Jacob's grandfather, okay? So that you may take possession of the land where you now reside. Notice that I have the words, take possession of the land underlined. There's a reason for that. The reason is, is because his father is not implying that he is going to be gifted the land that is going to, that he, that he's going to get from God. It's not going to be put to him on a silver platter. I don't know about you, but I prefer when things are placed on a silver platter. But anything worth worth going for in life is worth fighting for, is worth working for. You know that, you've, you've experienced that. The things you're most proud of are the things that you had to work for. And that's exactly what his dad is saying to him. Now, the problem is, is that whenever he says you need to take the land, there are other people in the land that currently own the land, that currently inhabit the land. And so what does that mean for, for Jacob? Well, that means he's gonna probably have to fight for it. He's probably gonna lose some people that are closest to him in battles in order to to get this land. Who knows what level Jacob is gonna have to go to take this land. And it sounds risky. 
And it sounds scary, but can I tell you something? The moments that are the riskiest and the scariest, those are the moments when they are in the middle of God's will that you are at your safest. It seems like they're risky. It seems like it's not gonna work out, but when you're doing what God has called you to do, you've never been safer. And that's because the second form of divine interventions that God often uses in our lives is through difficulty and challenges. It's through difficulty and challenges. You see, if we were to go on in Jacob's story, my, oh my, does he have difficulties and challenges. Like it is unbelievable uh, the, the, the number of trials and tribulations this guy had to go through. But it was through those difficulties and through challenges and through the struggle of life that God reveals Jacob's destiny to him. And my hope is that this reality of this biblical story would give you some, some hope in the middle of your trials, in the middle of your difficulties, that, that you would realize that these things that you're going through, they aren't just random. They're not just bad luck. But that when you find yourself in the middle of difficulties, that God may be, just may be pushing you toward your destiny. Let me give you some examples of that. Students in the room, especially if you're a sophomore, junior, maybe some seniors uh, might have experienced this already. Let's say you have had your heart set on going to a specific university, a specific college. You, you want to go there so bad, you figured out your major, and so you apply for it, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, that letter comes back, and all of a sudden, you see the first words are, we are sorry to inform you, and you get rejected. And it feels like an incredible struggle. It feels like an incredible difficulty. It feels like your life is gonna come to an end. But what if... God is using that difficulty to point you in a new direction to show you, no, 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 I have a better plan. I have a different plan for you. And, and for those of you who, who are currently working and in, in in, in you have a, you're in a profession, and, and maybe you find yourself in a moment where you're having a professional setback and you're like, I don't know if, if I don't even know if I like doing this. Like it just, I just feel like I'm just punching a clock. I feel like it's not worth it. I don't, I don't like what I'm doing. What if, all the stress of, of, of the challenges of, of doing something that maybe you don't feel like you should be doing. What if God is using this as an opportunity to point you in a new direction to better align you with what God has for your will, for his will in your life? What if up until this point, your life has just been too comfortable? You, you, you know, the paycheck has been steady and, and it's bad, but it's not that bad. And I hate my life, but at least there's Saturday and Sunday. But what if God is like, no, 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 that's, that's not what I want for you. I want you to live every day with purpose. And for those of you who are out there today and you're struggling with some sort of mental health issue, maybe it's depression or anxiety or an addiction, or maybe it's some other form of mental unrest where it feels like you have a weight on your shoulders every single day of your life. What if... God could be allowing you to go through that, pass through those challenges and go through those difficulties in order for you to speak and lead someone else through the exact same thing, but no one else could relate to them the way you can because of what you have gone through. What if God wants to use the brokenness of your past to help you to lead someone else so that they don't have to go through the same thing as you? All I'm saying is, is if you're going through hard stuff, if you're going through difficulties, if you're going through challenges, pay attention to what God may be doing in your life next. A valuable lesson I think we can learn about God's will and the difficulties and the struggles that we face is this. Your purpose is likely on the other side of your problem. Your purpose is likely on the other side of your problem. And so we need to ask God to reveal our next move, what to do next. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will begin to make things clearer and clearer, kind of like a camera lens. He will, he will adjust it and all of a sudden what was blurry will begin to be clear to us. You know, speaking of the Holy Spirit, I'd like to talk about the last and the most important divine intervention that God often uses Let's see what happens to Jacob as he's in the middle of the wilderness. Here, here's what it says. It says, 
Then he reached a certain, when he reached a certain place, that's Jacob, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones, notice I have that underlined, taking one of the stones there, he, he put it under his head and lay it down to sleep. He lay down to sleep. I'm sorry, but I feel like he could have done better than a rock uh, to, to use as a pillow. I, I mean, that's just me, but like, I, I think perhaps, you know, some leaves would have sufficed, you know, or even some pine branches. I know they're sap, uh, but I think if you lay in the right direction, uh, a little bit of sap in your hair is better than sleeping with your head on a rock, okay? That's just, I just don't, he must have been extremely tired. And, and clearly he was extremely tired because the, the Bible says that he eventually did fall asleep in time for God to give him a supernatural vision. Here's what it goes on to say. He, meaning Jacob, had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching up to heaven. And the angels of the Lord were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. And I will give you and your descendants, the land on which you are now lying. In his dream, Jacob hears this booming voice. It is the voice of God announcing that he is going to build a mighty nation coming from Jacob, right where he is laying on the ground in the middle of struggle, in the middle of challenges, right there as he's using a rock as a pillow. Couldn't be more uncomfortable. But what mighty nation is God going to build out of Jacob? <laughs> well, if we were to read on in Jacob's story, we would find that he has his ups and downs. Don't get me wrong. He, he continues to make some mistakes. But at some point in the future, he gets to the point where he wants God's will so much that he gets into a wrestling match with an angel all night long. And at the end of the wrestling match, Jacob just will not give up because he is seeking after God's will so much. And at the end of the, the wrestling match, the angel says to him, Jacob, I'm giving you a new name. Now I'm gonna share with you the name that he's going to give him. And you're gonna recognize this name, but not because it's necessarily the name of a person you know, but because it's the name of a nation that you know. Jacob, you are no longer gonna be Jacob, but instead I am going to name you Israel. Israel. Did you know that? Did you know that, that God would use the brokenness of someone who's made tons of mistakes in their lives? Someone who, who was a deceiver and who, who had, I mean, just ups and downs his entire life. And yet he would build a nation known as Israel. Don't know if you know this, if you're new to church, that is like the centerpiece of the Christian faith. That is the, the nation on which God built his entire story for us. And it came from a man named Jacob who figured out what God's will was and had his name changed so that he could discover his destiny, which is the nation of Israel. Incredible. And, and, and while Jacob got to see through that dream, he got to see God at the top of a staircase in heaven. I mean, that's a pretty cool, that's a pretty cool thing. But guess what? Can I tell you something? You and I, we have something far better than that. You and I, if we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you and I have the Spirit of God living within our rib cage. You see, the third and final way that I wanna share with you that God shares divine interventions and the most powerful way that he shares divine interventions is through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, even in this moment, the Holy Spirit is pursuing you. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. If you do not, the Holy Spirit is pursuing your heart right now and saying, let me in, let me in. I wanna direct you. I have a plan for you. You won't even, you can't even fathom. It's immeasurable. I wanna do so much in and through you but we have the power of the Holy Spirit for those of us who are followers of Jesus 
within us. The Bible says that the, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that is found within me. That is the Holy Spirit. We have to live with that truth in mind that, that even the whisper of a prayer that comes off your lips activates the Holy Spirit in your life activates what God wants to do in your life. And when that fact hits you, everything changes. When we're on our way toward our journey toward God's will, it's important to know that there's gonna be some mystery. There's gonna be some unknowns. We, we all know that. There's gonna be some uncertainties. There's gonna come lots of times where we're gonna in, intersect with a crossroads and we're not gonna know which way to go there's gonna come times in our lives where we're gonna ask God, God, what in the world is going on? Why am I going through all this? What is the purpose of all these struggles? Why would you not hear me? There might even come a time where you're asking, God, are you even there? Because I, I can't see you. I don't, I don't experience you. There might even come a time when it feels like you are in the middle of the wilderness and the only thing you have to lay your head on is a rock. It is so uncomfortable. But can I tell you something? That's okay. And the reason that that is okay is because our job in life as a follower of Jesus is not to be comfortable. Our job as a follower of Jesus is to pursue his will for me and for you. And one of the ways that God reveals his will in our lives is through divine interventions. Look out for those divine interventions and know where to find them. Where can we find those divine interventions? Well, we need to start seeking out godly counsel. Maybe you already are, keep it up. If you aren't, it's time to start. For, for some of us, we've been scratching our heads and saying, why me? Woe is me. Why am I having all these challenges? Why am I having all these difficulties? And God's like, no, you don't understand. I'm using those difficulties to show you that I wanna, I wanna use um, those situations in order to show myself to you, just like I did through Jacob. And the last way is through the power of the Holy Spirit, is that we have to understand that, that God is speaking to us every second of every day through the power of God that is living within us. And when we pursue God and when we look for those divine interventions, guess what? God will light up your path. He may not give you a spotlight, but he'll at least tell you the next step to take, one step at a time. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for all that you've done. And uh, God, I pray that you would um, just please be in the midst of this situation, Lord, and that you would, um, you would help us to, to recognize that you love us so much and that you give us these divine interventions. Help us, Lord, to, to, to be in the, the right posture that we, that we understand that we can't do life alone, that we need godly people, that challenges, though they're difficult, sometimes you're using them. And Father, that we can always depend on your Holy Spirit to give us direction. So help us to always do that. Thank you for the divine interventions that you give us every day. Help us to be more open and aware of those things every single moment of every single day. It's in your name we pray, amen.